Thank you, Chris. How is the water? Too hot? Not hot enough? <laughs> Just right. How does it go? In the old days, there were 16 bodhisattvas. I got stuck on in the old days. <clears throat> I'm wondering, in the old days, what's that about? And as often happens, just having the question brought the answer as I was noodling around, and there it was. This is a story from the Surangama Sutra in which there were only 16 bodhisattvas. That's all there were. It's at the beginning. And they've gathered together to share their uh, awakening stories. And the first five are the original disciples of the Buddha the ones he practiced together with and then left and then got back together with and they joined him. And they start out by sharing their stories about their awakening experience. The first one mentions that it was sight. It was something they saw that woke them up. The second one said it was a fragrance. I think it was a flower that woke them up. The third one said it was a taste. I can identify with that. That woke them up. And the fourth one tells this story about getting in the bath together and says it was touch that woke him up. The touch of the water, the subtle touch of the water. After they've shared, the last uh, bodhisattva to share is Avalokiteshvara, who informs them that it was hearing that woke him, her up. All the senses. Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Oh, mind wasn't mentioned, was it? Eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. Now, there was something about the importance of the senses I could feel and feel how important that is in koan practice where we involve our bodies, our senses. Maybe that's why mind was left out. It doesn't help. It confuses us. Then I got stuck on, I kept hearing the koan differently. Maybe you've noticed this, that he's spent time with koans, that sometimes they seem to change all by themselves and as, you, as they visit you, wearing different clothes or something. And um, though the text that appeared in the uh, on our website says they all got into the bath together and realized the cause of water well first of all I thought they all got into the bath together and I had this image of 16 people standing in a circle holding hands and jumping in together they all got in together or maybe they got in by you know sitting down and getting into it was core it was like you know it was like us bowing we all do it together they all got in together. But most of the time, the way the koan came to visit me was, it was enter. They, they all entered. And together realized the cause of water. Separating the entering and the realizing somehow. I thought, oh, that's interesting. What's that about? And I'm thinking about entering. Entering a bath. I love the thing. One of the things I love the most about going to Japan is the baths. Soaking in hot water. 
And um, I noticed that different people have different ways of entering the bath. And that seems important because we each have our own different ways of entering, don't we? And to honor those differences. And um, I tend to walk in and sit down. The water is usually about maybe mid-thigh height. And as I walk in, I can, you know, I can tell that it's not so hot that I'm going to regret just sitting down in it or something. So I can sit down. Some people kind of lower themselves in slowly, maybe more sensitive to the heat. And they sit on the edge with their feet dangling in, and then they kind of hold themselves up with their hands and lift themselves up and slowly lower themselves in as much as they can hold themselves up and then they're in. And again, there's no right way. It's just what is your way of getting in? What was your way of entering this retreat, this bath together with us here? And I'm going to come back to that, but um, just to keep sort of a chronological experience log of the koan. After I've spent some time in, in sort of inquiring into, I guess, the entering of the bath, my own entering, other people's entering, what I notice about entering, the way it releases tension, tension I didn't even know I had. Even when the water is not so hot, if I don't have the idea that the water is not, too, not hot enough, then I, the tension is relieved. If I'm thinking the water's too hot, I'm holding that tension and it sort of lingers there in the water with me. Sometimes I judge my meditation as not being too hot. And similarly, it just gets in the way, you know. Anyway, that I might judge it rather than just having it, being it. But where the koan took me next was a, a sort of further exploration of entering. But I wasn't entering a bath. I was entering the pool, which I do more than I do enter the bath, I have to admit. We don't have a bath. We have showers, you know. And um, so there I was. Um, unlike the bath in Japan. I don't just walk into the pool and sit down. I sit down on the edge with my feet dangling in. Which isn't about getting used to the water. It's about kind of saying hello to the water and the water saying hello to me. We're greeting each other like the morning greeting this morning. Hi, how are you doing? Good morning. And again, as in the Japanese baths, I notice everybody's got their own way of doing it. Some people dive in head first. You're not supposed to do that, but they do it, you know, okay. Some people uh, jump in, feet first, you know, boom. Sometimes holding their nose, you know. Um, some people use the ladder, that's interesting. As they step down slowly, lowering themselves into the water, but there's not too many rungs on that ladder. You get down to about waist high and there's no more rungs. So then you kind of, how do you negotiate that? Do you sort of just step into the water or do you, some people actually hold on to the sides of the ladder and slide down as they're holding on to the ladder. You know? That's just interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, 
after I've been sitting there on the edge with my feet dangling in and I get my goggles on and such, um, at some point, I notice that I'm not sitting on the edge of the pool anymore. I'm sitting on the water, which is to say my arms have pushed me off the edge of the pool but my body position is the same. I'm still sort of like, you know, do, do, do. And there's a point at which I'm, I'm aware more and more as I pay attention that there's a moment when I'm sitting on the water, which took me to this other koan about a sieve. And again, um, this is for me what koan practice is like koans come and visit and have conversations with each other and then they leave and another koan may came, come. And the Sith koan came and um, where a teacher said something like, you know, the nature of practice is like a sieve and um, took a student, a sieve, down to the ocean and gave the sieve to the student who tried to fill it and wasn't successful. And then he takes it and throws it out onto the ocean. And we're told, and for a moment, it floated before it sank. And that's an interesting detail. It's always caught my attention about that place where um, it's kind of like the dream world. I'm, I'm in both worlds. I'm in the water, but I'm not in the water. I'm on the water. The water is holding me up. I just don't sink. I, and I can feel, I don't know if I'd call it the subtle touch of the water, but there's something about the water supporting me that I appreciate. Feels like the way I appreciate my practice supporting me. But for me to be able to appreciate the water supporting me, I have to uh, let go. And that's part of, I guess, my getting more intimate with the water as I sit on it and then I sink. And um, part of that sinking is, um, I think the residual constriction of my muscles from having gotten off the edge of the pool. My muscles are constricted and constricted muscles sink. When you're tight, when I'm tight, I sink in the water or in my life. We all know what that is. We get tight, you know, we get uptight. <laughs> and I sink, I don't feel the support of the Tao, of the water. Then, you know, as that muscle tension releases and I'm no longer, my muscles are just relaxing from having made this effort. The temperature of the water doesn't seem to be a big issue. More that it's the tension in my body from making the exertion and as that tension releases, I rise, and I, and it's like something has its hands underneath me and pushes me up. And I notice that on different days, I'll sink down farther than other days before that happens, and I get that boost up. But I, I know that that boost is there. I trust it. It's not an intellectual knowing. It's in my body. I know it. And again, koan practice comes to mind and how uh, even in the midst of falling, sinking into what I don't want to sink into, I can feel that support holding me up if I just let it be what it is, whatever it is. A retreat like this is a great opportunity to have those kinds of experiences. Um, you know, letting go of the way I would like it to be and noticing what I notice that way. You know, looking at all these faces and feeling that support the water, you are the water, we are the water.
One description of awakening is water added to water. Um, I think I think it was John yesterday talking about how we don't just, it's not just us entering the bath, the bath enters us too. And there's that place. The sieve floating on the water, then it enters the water. It is the water. But once I got into the, once I'm in the pool, um, then I'm appreciating the subtle touch of water, not the way it holds me up, but the way it informs me about what's moving in my heart mind as I'm swimming. And noticing when I, um, you know, the pool has mm, float lines that divide the lanes so that it kind of cuts down on the waves that each swimmer is creating but nonetheless the water is moving and i can feel the people in the lanes next to me through that water um you know especially on turns where one of us is going one way and the other one's going the other way and the water is just churning and i can it's like not it's not exactly like i'm feeling the water i'm feeling the person you may have noticed that as you look around the screen feeling the people you see as we're here in this water and the water informs me when i'm watching another swimmer and comparing my swimming with their swimming <laughs> either way i'm better than they're better than whatever And how I, um, yeah, I'm not moving through the water as easily. The water tells me about that. I may not have been noticing it, but I do notice that hmm, I'm not, I'm not flowing through the water. I feel like I'm pulling myself through the water, dragging myself through the water. Huh? What's that about? And I notice, oh, and then. The storehouse of treasure opens by itself comes to pace a visit. And I appreciate I didn't do anything. It just was a gift to me, really. Those moments of, oh, I'm doing that. And how doing something I wish I wasn't doing, I can't separate it from the treasure of recognizing what I'm doing. I mean, they can't be separated. And how everything is a treasure, isn't it? In that place. Where the subtle touch of water is showing how the light is in everything. The light is in my deluded mind and all of those thoughts that I used to try to get rid of. And how when I stop trying to get rid of them, the storehouse of treasures opens by itself and they're not gone. But my attention is unstuck. And then I'm in the cave of the blue dragon. And, you know, I'm not doing this. They just come and pay me a visit and just, you know. So if you have the experience of hanging out with the koan, like say the one that we're hanging out with this week, Cherto and wasting time. Um, and then these other koans come and you think, oh, I'm not focusing, I'm getting distracted. Um, you know, just let that thought be and see if there might be some space around that where you might notice that, oh, this isn't a distraction. It's something connected. They're talking to each other. They're talking to me. And how in the cave of the blue dragon, and now I've got the cave of the blue dragon and the storehouse of treasures and the bodhisattvas in the bath. <laughs> um, 
very different feeling than the storehouse of treasures. I mean, it's a bit foreboding. How many times have I gone down to the cave of the blue dragon for you? It doesn't sound like the best, easiest, most desirable thing. And yet, yeah, how many times? How many more times? Where the blue dragon has this wish-fulfilling gem. I want that. The wish-fulfilling gem of just being able to let things be. But it's a dark cave. It's not inviting. And there's all of this stuff in the way between me and the blue dragon. And the stuff is me, you know, my comparing mind. My, all of the myriad forms that I basically fight with what is. And I have to uh, encounter them to get to where I want to go. And it's not about defeating them, like I'm, I've got a sword and, and we're gonna, I'm going to do battle. Um, it's about engaging them and being able to sort of set them aside. And I can't do that if I don't engage it just i have to hold it let it hold me and let it move through me and then i can progress and all of these things these unskillful mind habits that i have i set aside they're not they haven't gone anywhere they're just not in the way anymore and then i'm swept back to the 16 bodhisattvas and that fourth bodhisattva talking about the bath, where he says this interesting thing. We did not wash off the dirt. We did not wash the body. And how that came along right after the blue dragon's cave, where I'm not getting rid of anything. I'm just setting it aside. And again, it's, you know, I could say I'm setting it aside, but at the same time, it's really feels like my attention is freed from being stuck on them like Velcro or something, and it can move on to whatever is next. And um, then I was taken back to Japan. and I have a screen share. I don't know if I can do a screen share. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Here. To a bath in Japan. Um, this is what it looks like, more or less, everywhere you go. All those little white tubs that you sit on in front of uh, two faucets, one hot and one cold, and a little handheld shower thing up there. Um, because they do wash their bodies before they get in the bath. Right? You don't wash yourself in the bath. You get in the bath after you're clean. While I appreciate that as a bathing technique and again it's like not only watching how everybody lowers themselves in the bath you can watch how everybody washes themselves and that's interesting but that's not what we do and that's not what the fourth bodhisattva reported as what they did they weren't cleaning themselves off they were just soaking in it all of it all of themselves, even the bits they don't particularly want, I don't want. And we sit in that soup together. And it's not about getting clean, it's about being free. And Sherto asking, who is binding you? And how that question is the practice not it's not an accusatory thing i'm not blaming somebody i want to know how does this work who's doing this <laughs> to whom here and back to the treasure house of the storehouse of treasures and master ma who i think we're going to be maybe hanging out with sometime in the future near future when someone came to master ma he asked well 
what do you seek? And they said, enlightenment. And Ma's response was, you have your own storehouse of treasures. Why do you search outside? And the person said, where is my storehouse of treasures? And Ma said, what you are asking is your storehouse of treasures. It opens by itself. And um, then I was back in the pool again. And um, remembering how it was a different pool. It was a pool in Hawaii where I learned. Uh, I studied Tai Chi there while I was living there. And the teacher uh, suggested that we practice standing up to our necks in water to get the feeling of what it is that we're really doing and how the water, as we moved in the water, feeling the water moving and the resistance of the water as we moved and the support of the water was exactly what we were doing when we were not in the water, but we were moving energy. And to be able to get sort of sensitized to what that's sort of like, you know, and how us being here now, doing this, soaking in this bath together, moving in the bath together, feeling the water moving, feeling the effects of other people moving in the water. Also, especially now when we're doing this at home, sensitizes me, maybe you too, to, you know, leaving the water and still feeling that sense of there's something here that I'm connected to and that's moving with me, in me, through me. Well, I guess it's back to Sherto, but it's Yao Shan, not Sherto, when he says, you know, not even the 10,000 sages know what this not doing is. So notice, as we're sitting together these next days, if you start thinking you know what we're doing, and um, I won't say stop doing it, but I would hope that you might remember Yao Shan's uh, advice that even the 10,000 sages don't know what we're doing. I found a poem, and I think I'd like to end with that. It's, from, uh, it's an excerpt from Raven Carver called Where Water Comes Together with Other Water. I love creeks and the music they make and rills in glades and meadows before they have the chance to become creeks. I may even love them best of all, for their secrecy. I almost forgot to say something about the source. Can anything be more wonderful than a spring? But the big streams, they have my heart too. In the places streams flow into rivers, the open mouths of rivers where they join the sea, the places where water comes together with other water. Those places stand out in my mind like holy places. I'll take all the time I please this afternoon before leaving my place along this river. It pleases me, loving rivers, loving them all the way back to their source, loving everything that increases me. Thank you.